Hello, in this lecture we will uh, wrap up lesson three uh, and briefly discuss the Trinity under the aspect of the absolute attributes of God and then looking more into the economy of salvation, uh, the unity of the Trinity in a diversity of manifestations and appropriations and also I hope to touch upon the absolute attributes of God insofar as uh, divine names and um, this will be an interesting discussion because it speaks to the limitations of our knowledge with respect to the incomprehensible essence of God and how we speak of God in terms of what God has caused or created. So to begin with, uh, let us give a brief descri description of the absolute attributes of God. And these absolute attributes are wrapped up or capsulated in seven basic qualities or names that we attribute to God and his being. The first is unity, then from unity, simplicity, uh, then simplicity, infinity, then eternity, immutability, necessity, and primacy. And what's interesting about each of these attributes is how they interrelate in order to begin discussing of any kind of being, as uh, Boethius says, first that being must have a certain measure of unity. That means he must, or it must, be one in order for it to be even in existence. <clears throat> and so we attribute unity to God, meaning God is absolutely one and uniquely one in his being. And as we consider the aspect of unity in terms of an absolute attribute of God, we also know on the, at the same time that the unity of God flows from and derives from and is preserved by the prior fontal causality of the Father. And so unity refers to both unity of essence, meaning there is only one God, there, and it's impossible for there to be more than one God. And then when we affirm simplicity, what we're affirming is that God in his being that is, God, in his infinite perfection, is not able to be improved or diminished in any way. Thus, he is not susceptible to augmentation, being added to, as well as he's not susceptible to becoming a part of any other being. In his simplicity, he is absolutely one and fully himself. And in some sense, then, uh, what philosophical language speaks of, or the language philosophy uses when it speaks of the simplicity of God, is that God is not composed of parts. So God, um, certain qualities do not come together to make God's being. God is absolutely simple. So in each and every aspect of his being, he is perfectly unified, and there is nothing prior or upon which God depends for his being. So that's, in a sense, simplicity stated in a nutshell. God is not composed, nor is he susceptible of composition in himself or with respect to any other being. In terms of simplicity in, in its positive aspect, uh, simplicity implies absolute and highest perfection. So an absolutely simple being is the highest being, and as highest, he will be absolutely perfect. Thus, any perfection that does not imply limitation does not imply finitude, can be attributed to God and should be attributed to God. And so by saying God is simple, we say that he is non-composed and absolutely perfect. Interestingly enough, then, simplicity bleeds right and removes right into the concept of infinity, which states that God has unlimited power to create because he is unlimited in his perfection. So simplicity refers to God's non-composition, and infinity refers to God's perfection or perfections that do not render God composed, but yet posit a kind of distinction. Thus, the infinity of God, he is infinitely powerful, he can create infinitely many things, but also in terms of his own being. God has an infinite number of perfections and ideas, thus he knows all realities, past, present, and future, and he knows all possible realities. And in the relation of his, his perfection, then, 
his perfect knowledge supplies the object the, or rather the quasi object of his will so thus God's will can choose or select or prefer any number of those infinite possibilities and so in his infinity we're affirming that God is unlimited in his being there's no possible um, circumscribing set of conditions or constraints outside of God that limit what God is in himself and then moving on to eternity interestingly enough eternity is simply the combination of simplicity and infinity eternity is described by again Boethius as the complete or total simultaneous possession of infinite life so you can see by saying total or simultaneous we're speaking of simplicity because God is not composed of distinct moments or distinct parts and then obviously complete or perfect or infinite life refers to infinity itself so we can see that simplicity and infinity in a sense inform and condition our understanding of eternity then from eternity if God is eternal and his life is full and complete admitting of no augmentation or diminution well then God is immutable this immutability refers to again God's absolute unity simplicity infinity and eternity meaning God cannot change in his essence or being God's being is always perfect there's nothing greater for him to become and because he is infinite and eternal he can in no way become less than what he is then if something is obviously immutable if God is immutable then God must be necessary Necess necessary or necessity is a condition of God's being that says God must be this way God cannot be any other way than God is because God is absolutely perfect in his unity simplicity infinity eternity and immutability now necessity on the other hand even though it admits of it, it it speaks of an absolute perfection it also allows for in God's infinite perfection and simplicity the most perfect modes or ways of action um, thus we can say a necessary being an infinite eternal and perfect being will be a personal being and by personal we mean endowed with intellect and will thus as intellectual being God knows all possible things and as a being endowed with will God is free in his actions God is not constrained by any conditions outside of himself and because in his essence God is perfect his perfection is no constraint it rather is the ground of perfect freedom and then finally from all of this moving from unity through simplicity to infinity and eternity and immutability arriving at necessity and the rev and the realization that necessary being is also perfect personal and free being we arrive at the concept of primacy and primacy in a sense encapsulates the previous six characteristics because it speaks of God as the first in principle being and as first in principle being God is in perfect act that means God is not waiting for some moment to act no his very being is already perfect his being is eternally perfect and this eternal perfection speaks both to his essence meaning those qualities which each of the divine persons share by virtue of their real identity with the being of God but it also speaks to a primacy within the Godhead with respect to the order of persons so if God is first being and as first being each person each divine person is first in his being well within the order of the Trinity itself there will be a first and that firstness then is ascribed to the father the monarch and sole cause of the hypostatic origins of the father and then of the son excuse me and then through the son the spirit thus the being of God is first terminated in the person of the father and then the father as the fontal source that eternal 
overflowing source of infinite goodness in life generates the word by be, by begetting the word or by speaking the word and then through that word the spirit proceeds from the father and thus the father is the source of all primacy in God in terms of the order of persons as well as in his being in terms of the commonly shared perfections of each person of the Godhead so now that we've had said said a few words about uh, God's absolute qualities and by no means um, is this list exhaustive if God is infinite well then God has an infinite number of perfect qualities and by no means can any uh, list that we come up with uh, indicate or specify or limit uh, the range of God's perfections uh, we simply list those seven as most evident and um, in some sense most basic for our ability to understand begin to understand God and to speak about God now moving on to the, the question of divine names. Um, it's important to note because God is eternal and God is infinite, the two, in a sense, key qualities of God that are revealed both in creation and then through revelation, God's essence is incomprehensible. And if it's incomprehensible, it's unknowable in its perfection. There's no possibility for the created mind to come to a knowledge of the divine essence because the divine essence is infinite. Now, clearly we can know in part, we can have a personal relationship with God in virtue of the Holy Spirit, but in no way do we thereby know God in his very infinity because infinity by definition and eternity by definition are not able to be communicated to a being who isn't itself also infinite and eternal. And therefore, um, God's essence as infinite can't be participated by finite minds, finite concepts. So if God then is unknowable in essence, he is also unnameable in terms of any kind of proper name. Um, and so St. John Damascene explains this in chapter 12 of book one of the De Fide Orthodoxa by saying that names are primarily from created, that is, caused things. We learn to speak about God in terms of what things God has caused to be and to be perceptible in our range of experience as finite beings. And so the, when we speak of God, then we speak of God usually or traditionally according to three modes. We can speak by negation, by affirmation, or by eminence. And <clears throat> basically, these are all ways of saying, yes, we truly can refer to God in our language and in our concepts, but our concepts never capture the incomprehensible essence of God, and thus our names never are a proper name that captures the infinite, incomprehensible essence of God. And so then we, when we say by something by negation for example if we say that god is not wise we're not saying that god lacks wisdom as a perfection no god is infinitely perfect but when we say god is not wise what we say is on the basis of our knowledge of created wisdom we know that god is not wise in that sense as created as limited so if we say peter is wise and then we say God is wise we will follow that up upon realizing that God is infinite wisdom in his infinite perfection and simplicity and Peter is finite wisdom in God wisdom is a necessary quality because God's being is infinite and simple again and Peter wisdom is an accident and Peter can after acting in a wise manner or even having a habit of wisdom he can then do something very foolish so if, when we speak by negation, then we, we are affirming that God is super essential. God is, God is infinitely above our mode of discourse in his very being. So we're saying God is wise, but God is not wise. 
in the sense that any created person can be called wise. And then the next sense is by, by affirmation. And, and this is just a simple statement that, well, God is wise and, and Peter is wise. And so in some way, this locates some sort of concept of wisdom that allows us to speak of the wisdom that we see in creation and then attribute by analogy to God. And this is, this is a, a simple and basic way. This is, in a sense, the starting point of language about God is we, we affirm something. We affirm that, that God, is, God is wise and man is wise. But of course, we don't uh, in any way affirm that God is wise in the sense that man is wise. God is not wise as Peter and Paul are wise. So the way of um, affirmation is, is really a most basic way that requires theological and philosophical distinctions to uh, be put into play in order for our language to become uh, more adequate. And so the, the, the way of negation is always safer because one cannot be wrong. Because if we look upon created things and we say, God is not that, God is not caused, well, we can never actually be wrong. However, language of pure negation ends up not telling us very much about uh, God at all. So we also have, uh, we begin by affirmation and then move to negation, uh, presupposing that the affirmation speaks something true about God because God is the cause of creation and creation can't speak falsely about God's being, even if it doesn't speak fully about God's being. And then finally, we can um, speak of God by eminence or supereminence. That is by saying that, again, to keeping the example of wisdom, we can say that God is wise. We can say that Peter is wise. But we can say that God is supereminently wise. Or we can say that Peter has being and God has being, but by the way of eminence, we would say that God has super or hyper being. And what we're, what we're doing here is, is, in a sense, the same, it's getting at the same reality as the language by negation. But instead of denying an attribute, we're affirming an attribute in uh, ineffable and um, mysterious way. So the, the way by eminence is also a valid way to speak about God, and it has its place. So if we say that God is good, we can say that God is eminently or maximally good. Or we can say that God is not good, and say that God is not good like creation is good, because creation is caused and limited. But the basis of This third section, which deals with the unity of the divine essence or divine being and the pure plurality of manifestation, uh, begins with the premise that um, God is I infinite spirit, and thus, as infinite, infinite, he is unnameable in his being or essence in any proper or, or comprehensive sense, and he is perfectly unified, simple, infinite, eternal, immutable, necessary, and the primary being but nevertheless, even though God is infinite and, can, and in no way um, can be communicated or participated in his very being by any other being not infinite, nevertheless, he does manifest himself in a multiplicity of ways through what uh, Latin theology calls various instances of God's grace or work or uh, what Eastern theology might call the divine energy. And just picking on a few or picking out a few of these manifestations, we can say that God dwells or manifests himself uh, in the saints in a special way. That means God manifests his goodness and holiness, the sanctity of the divine being, um, his power in converting the heart and in drawing created persons to himself through the saints and through their own conformity to him through um, obedience to his will. He also appears so he doesn't just dwell through the divine energies or grace that allow us to allow the saints to act in a in a cooperative or synergistic manner with God through the Holy Spirit. He also appears through signs, visions, 
um, through dreams. And this is a way that he communicates his will in <clears throat> an, a unique way uh, to, say, the prophets and the um, apostles. Moreover, we can say that God doesn't just dwell in the saints or appear to the prophets. He, he descends from heaven. He descended from heaven most um, clearly in the incarnation of his son and then through the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, manifest at Pentecost. Um, but also, he, we can say he truly descended in terms of appearances in the uh, many Old Testament theophanies, or as the earlier um, patristic tradition liked to say, Christophanies. That is, when either an angel manifesting God or imaging God in creation, or the Word himself in a pre-incarnate form appears to prophets or to individuals whom God has selected in order to reveal his will or to declare his his judgment. Um, and so, for example, the, uh, the appearance of the three men or angels to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre in, I believe, Genesis uh, chapter 18, or perhaps the appearance of um, the burning bush uh, to Moses on the mountain in the book of Exodus, or um, we could think of the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud that led the uh, Israelites in their exodus to the promised land from Egypt. All of these are ways in which God has descended from heaven. And in that sense, even though God is infinite, he has the power to manifest himself through the indwelling in the saints, the appearing to prophets through signs and visions, and also his descent from heaven in various theophanies and means of communication. And then, as we mentioned before, the ultimate descent um, <clears throat> or descending from heaven is realized in the missions of the Spirit, in the, the Son and the Spirit, in the economy of salvation. God sent the Father, God the Father sent his Son, and then through the Son sent his Spirit in order to fulfill the plan of all creation, that is to recapitulate and sum up under the headship of the Son of God in his divine human hypostasis, his divine human person, and thus fulfill creation and ultimately and most perfectly manifest himself, like the book of Hebrews says, in in past times in diverse and sundry ways God sent prophets, etc. But in these last days he sent his own son. And in this sense then the we can see also that within this concept or general heading of a plurality of manifestations while maintaining the unity of the divine being or essence, we find that the Son and the Spirit are the most perfect manifestations of God's being because they most perfectly manifest the plurality of persons in the unity of essence in the one economy of salvation. And then finally this last section of this uh, brief lecture wrapping up uh, lesson three we can speak of the unity of the divine nature and the multiplicity of apparitions or apparitions, excuse me. And often this, this comes under the heading of appropriations. That is, certain, certain qualities are appropriated to various persons of the Trinity as, in terms of our understanding, they give us an ability to, to recognize and appreciate the distinction of persons in God. So, <clears throat> For example, we would say that all the essential attributes of God, such as unity, simplicity, infinity, and so on, equally apply to, and without distinction, apply to all the persons of the Godhead. Yet, oneness can be spoken of as appropriated to the Father, truth to the Son, and goodness to the Spirit. Or, in another sense, um, eternity as that quality of the absolute primacy of the Father, 
with respect to the persons and thus the unity of the divine being, eternity can be attributed <clears throat> by appropriation to the Father. Splendor to the word and utility to the spirit, meaning the splendor of the Father, the image, the manifestation of the Father in the word and thus and then the utility or practical unification in the economy of salvation to the spirit. And then finally, there's another understanding or a third set of appropriations that follow from these first two. We can attribute a kind of efficient causality to the Father by appropriation. We can attribute a kind of formal or exemplary causality to the Word and to the Holy Spirit then we can attribute by via appropriation again with all of these a, a kind of final causality to the Holy Spirit because in each of these manifestations we can understand that while the unity of the divine being and God's actions outside of himself in the economy of salvation are a common activity of the three persons however efficient causality is easy, most easily understood, meaning God's creative power, is most easily attributed to the Father because the Father is the source of the persons in the Godhead. The Father is the originator, the first cause of the begotten Son and the spirated or the procession of the Holy Spirit. And thus the Son as word, as the image, the spoken word, to him can be attributed the formal causality, that is, that by which an entity is what it is, giving it its internal structure and meaning. And then finally, the spirit as the person of unity within the Godhead, well, the spirit in the economy of salvation has attributed to him by appropriation all of the graces of salvation. The Holy Spirit is the person of unity, the person that manifests and distributes grace to those being saved. And so in this sense, the unity and plurality of manifestations refers to several kinds of appropriation. And appropriation means that in a given instance, a, a term is used functionally, though not exclusively, of one person, meaning we speak of grace as attributed to the Holy Spirit, even though grace is the common activity of the entire Trinity. Grace is appropriated to the Holy Spirit, not as an exclusive quality of the Holy Spirit, but as being a most fitting attribution to the Spirit in terms of the Spirit's relation in the Godhead himself, and then the Spirit's, the theological language about the role of the Spirit in the economy of salvation. And so, <clears throat> These manifestations via appropriation help us to gain a practical and clearer understanding of God's plan and God's own life as a trinity, both through using and appropriating different terms to different persons of the trinity while recognizing that God's activity in creation, in the economy of salvation, is common to each person of the Trinity.